us to explain why the checks came to this area. And so I started a little bit back, so I hope that's all right with you. Just to get you um, a little background on it, during 1867 to 1918, this area of uh, Bohemia, Moravia, and Slovakia were all part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And at that time, there was a lot of turmoil that was going on. And just various things, you know, if you're lost in an empire and you want to keep your own um, culture and language going, that's not the best place to be. So they had two groups within the, the Bohemian area, Bohemian lands that argued back and forth with it, um, kind of keeping things in turmoil. Um, the old Czechs who favored the Germanized nobility and wanted to go ahead and keep things the way they were as part of, part of the landscape, their uh, kingdom going. And then later on, they developed young Czechs who were part of the intelligentsia. And they got into a, a disagreement and ended up coming out on top. And it pretty much ended all their options for compromise. And so with that kind of as a background, I think that's a lot of the reasons that the Czechs began to immigrate into the United States during that period. Beyond that, um, America was the place to be, you know, it was the land of opportunity and when you came from a place where there was very little farming land available, places, things that you could own, this option was very attractive to them and they started to come to improve their lives. This is a, a 2000 uh, census map, but the people that came quite often didn't come and stay in one place. Sometimes they were in two or three different places before they finally settled. So when we go through this, the Czechs from Malin came from New York, Minnesota, Canada, Texas, Iowa, Colorado, Kansas, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Illinois, to name a few. Almost all of them, I believe, were naturalized citizens when they moved into the basin. So you can see those areas are still highly populized by Czech people. It's an interesting story. Um, there was a, a magazine called Hospodar that was being printed in Omaha, Nebraska, and it was circulated throughout the United States. They promoted um, uh, settling in some of the, the water reclamation projects that the U.S. government was beginning to start. And they had about three different places from Arizona to Mexico to the Klamath Basin. And they sent, hired uh, scouts and sent them out to take a look at all three of those areas, four of those areas, and find the best place to have a colonization group start. So they decided to leave Omaha 19-9 in May, and they returned in August and of that same year. Coming back, swearing that the Klamath Basin was the best possible place to live. This is a um, kind of an old map that I think my mother drew up from uh, descriptions and stuff. But I want to point out, this is the state line across here. And Tule Lake actually went up at that time into what is now the city of, of Malin, up um, by the post office there. So it was a whole different outlook to it. The area that they settled in ran from this Barron's Point to um, kind of right in there we're looking at. Okay, they um, were partly here because of a man by the name of J. Frank Adams. And he met the scouts actually down in, I think it was Doris, uh, or um, no, Weed. It was Weed down that way. 
and convinced them that this was the best place to come, and they came and looked at it, and they agreed. And he bought a, a large strip of land, 6,800 acres, and proceeded to form the Lakeside Land Company, and then all the Bohemian settlers that came purchased their land from that uh, company. This was an extremely successful uh, project that they had. Um, there was only one farmer that quit, and there were no, no foreclosures, no arguments, no litigations between the company and the colonists at all. Okay, um, they arrived in September on the 30th in 1909. So all of this is taking place within six months that they've decided that they're gonna come and they arrive by the train and then they load up their horses and all those things on their wagons and they head out for Malin, which 30 miles with horses, they're fun. Uh, they stood to take a picture of this um, group up on a hill on that day, so I put that in there so you could see that. They paid about $35 an acre, and most bought about 50 acres, not very big, and they began building homes and clearing the sagebrush for fields. But you have to remember this is October, November, December, cold, right? It was not the best months to be seeing the basin. Uh, the first year was very difficult, and they had jackrabbits that ate their crops. And so if you've heard about the great jackrabbit roundups, well, this is what they're talking about. Um, the stack over here in the, on the right, this is like 2,000 jackrabbit ears that they got paid a nickel for a pair of ears, so it's kind of a big thing. They cleared that out. It's kind of one of those deals where, you know, you get rid of the coyotes because they're a problem, and then the coyotes are what were keeping the jackrabbits down, and so then you have to do something if you're gonna try to make a success out of farming. Uh, two ranchers, uh, W.C. Dalton and J. Frank Adams, were very, very helpful to the new settlers, and uh, they would do things like, here he's leaving this family something, sometimes it would be a ham or whatever food was short for the family, he'd come by and give them something, help them out. Uh, Frank Adams and I think both Dalton, somebody in there, one of the two of them, had equipment, and if you needed to borrow something, all he asked was that you write it on his barn door, and so he knew where it went and he could get it back. So, no problem. They wrote it on the barn door, and they got things back. Uh, this is just some of the early shots of the farming. The, all the manual labor, the horses that go in, the old plows, the cowboys out here working on the ranch. Um, many of the settlers worked for other people. They would take and um, work for the car ranch. Uh, my grandparents met and fell in love pretty much there on the car ranch. My grandmother cooked and my grandfather was a ranch hand. So that was kind of fun. Most of the original settlers were not farmers. None of the original settlers were farmers. Uh, most were naturalized citizens. What they did before, they were machinists, shoemakers, craftsmen, carpenters, blacksmiths, cabin makers, cabinet makers, tailors, and bricklayers. So they really had no experience being farmers, and that probably made it a little bit harder, too, to know how to get it going. They were innovative, they tried new things. Uh, potatoes were something that they tried very early on and, and was more successful with it than what was anticipated. They chose the name Malin uh, for the town. It's another name that's borrowed from a town in uh, Czechoslovakia that had horseradish vegetables and stuff and they found a horseradish plant 
nearby, and so he thought that Malin would be a good choice for the name. And I think it was pretty easy to say, so that's kind of a good thing too, because some of the Czech words are not too easy. Um, this is the school that they built. This is the inside of the store that they had. Do you see the, the, the stools there? The customers would come in and sit on the stools and then the, the um, owner and the service people would come and they'd fill their order and hand it to them. So you never went out and picked up your things off the shelf. Somebody else did it for you, which is kind of nice. And then they started building lots of things for the new community. That's the first theater that they had in um, Malin, and they had a Broadway Hall that is still there that they have renovated and fixed up. Um, the officers over here are the first of the ZCBJ club officers, and I would tell you what the ZCBJ stands for, but I can't pronounce it right. <laughs> so. Um, it has changed names, and it is now the Western Fraternal Life Association. And what it was was a fraternal organization that they set up so that if somebody died in the family, there would be some someone there, some money there to bury them and take care of the family. And they had a lot of social events that involved that also. So if you've heard of our Ethernet's a dinner. That comes every February, and it is the, a Czech sausage that we fix and have a whole dinner for everyone. And that comes as one of the events that has been going for a long time there. Now, the movie theater at times when my dad was growing up in the 20s, 30s, 30s, was um, a nickel to go see the movie. And you can see exciting things like, um, I drew his name, darn it. Oh well, anyway, the, the serial shows that went on during that time, you'd go and you'd see an installment, and the next week you'd come and you'd see another installment, and Buck Rogers and those type of guys, you'd see them around. Uh, by 1928, let's see. They're butchering hogs he here. Uh, this is Kalina's store. You see the horse and wagons out that way. Uh, this is a, the grain mill that they have there. And there are just kind of some ladies enjoying life, I guess. I don't know what else. Pretty hard life sometimes. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. Let me do this. 1928, Malin had grown and had several beautiful homes, stores, garages, a blacksmith shop, a cheese factory, flour mill, three lumber yards, post office, a telephone and telegraph office, a bank, hotels, restaurants, a fine grade school, and an accredited union high school. And there are also several lodges and societies like the ZCBJ lodge that I talked about for just a minute. So it was a pretty bustling place, really, and had um, amazing entertainment at times. They'd have whole big dances. In the top of the um, grocery store that you saw, they had an upper floor, and they'd hold dances, and they'd come, and the kids would sleep on the, the coats and stuff in the back room, and the parents would dance until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And, and have a good time with that. So, 1928, they also uh, hosted the Pacific State Sokol Celebration. And I don't know how to explain it other than it's kind of a physical fitness club. I think it's probably the best way to do it. And they, they were doing things like the rings, you know, that you see in the Olympics where they pull on the rings and do the flips and whatever. And the, the guy over here on the horse is, yeah, what do I do? He's doing the handstand over here. And so they're marching in that. 
So I've got another picture of that because it was a pretty cool thing to host that. That's less than 20 years after they get, built the town. They're doing these type of things. So they're innovative, they work together, they are very community minded. They like their culture, they like to keep a hold of it and share it around. Um, we have continued quite often with the dancing. Um, this is the middle of Malin Park out there and at times it was totally full when they had separate celebrations every 10 years, the big celebrations, not all the time. Uh, some old costumes, this one in particular, is pretty ornate. Uh, Malin's beautiful park. I'm sure most of you have been out there, I hope. Maybe? No? Anyway, um, at one time it had more different tr tree varieties of trees than any other place in Oregon. Um, in 1948, they added a swimming pool, and that was because a couple of kids had drowned in one of the ditches that were, you know, the drain ditches that they have around throughout the whole area here. And so they added a swimming pool and taught swimming lessons so that that wouldn't happen again. Uh, this is just a shot of coming over the hill and that's Malin's tower and that's Malin down there. But it looks very neat and orderly and great fields going on. More with the park, about 800 people live in Malin. Um, all of this new park equipment for the kids is another thing that they're trying to do. They have a, a proposal in to build an amphitheater out there, so they're excited about that, so I'm hoping that that goes through. The store that we looked at one of them with the thing it was Kalina's, and Kalina's is still there, and they're one of the original families. There are a lot of people that are descendants of the original families, but have different names now. So my name's Fillmore, but I was a Victorine, so that's kind of where it goes. They marry and, and go to other places, surprisingly enough, because they get educated, and it seems to be the way of things. This is a, a museum that they have, that they've been starting and working on, and it's very nice. Uh, you do have to ask for them to open it. It's not open all the time, but it's a neat museum. And if you go down to Kalina's and ask them, they will probably get it open for you. And I think, oh, uh, just uh, this, what I drove by and they were um, harvesting a field of carrots and I didn't really realize that we were doing carrots so much, but there are carrots. This is Malin from the other side, and this is the rainbow at the end. <laughs> it's Malin. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's what I have for you, unless you want me to go ahead and say what I think needs to be a community, or if we want to do that all at the end. Why don't you just go ahead? You've got the mic. OK, define a healthy community. I think having respect for all other me me members of the community is vitally important. Um, I think strong family units need to be encouraged. I think jobs need to be available, paying living wages. I think there needs to be good health care, including good food, clean water. I think all members can, should be contributing in some way to the commu community, and I think there's some way possible for virtually everyone to do that. And there needs to be really excellent schools. So thank you.